Here we go. We are going to get started. Thank you to everyone joining us here in the room, and thank you for joining us uh, in our online audience today. Uh, I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to our briefing today, Maximizing the Impact of Natural Climate Solutions. Big thanks to our partners, U.S. Nature for Climate and the Bipartisan Policy Center for their support for this briefing and just general awesomeness. Um, thanks to Representative Matsui and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, led by Representative Tonko, for help with the room today. Uh, we are celebrating 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education. Um, ESI was founded by, hello, uh, founded by a bipartisan group of members of Congress. And since 1984, we have worked to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. Our resources are timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. We put a lot of thought into these resources to always be science-based and ready when congressional staff needs the information. What does congressional education look like? Well, you're sitting in it. Uh, this is one of our briefings. We'll do about 20 of them total this year. We'll bring in a tremendous panels of experts to help educate congressional staff about these topics, today natural climate solutions, but we cover a lot of ground. We also look at budget and appropriations process, sustainable energy in America Factbook, which comes out every spring. We keep track of the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and Inflation Reduction Jobs Act every six months with a progress report briefing. We did a briefing not that long ago on ocean carbon dioxide removal, dam removal, small and medium-sized city climate solutions, and even more. And our next event after today will be on Tuesday, July 30th, when we will have the uh, 27th annual Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. It is a day-long affair, seven panels, almost 30 panelists, and a reception. Uh, it'll take place in the R Gold Room, which is in the Rayburn Building, and the Rayburn Foyer. It is gonna be off the hook. And if you uh, would like to RSVP for that, the best way to keep track of everything and sign up for our resources is to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Everything is always available for free online at www.esi.org. It also looks like other things. In addition to all the cool briefings we do, we also do really nice fact sheets. This is our, our climate jobs fact sheet that Nicole's been working on. It's amazing. It goes through renewable energy, energy efficiency jobs, sustainable transportation, and adaptation and resilience jobs, which are often uncounted and something that maybe people don't think about as climate jobs. And speaking of Nicole, we've also been putting together a load of amazing Farm Bill resources. We have Farm Bill articles, we have Farm Bill briefings, and we have side-by-side-by-side -side -by -side comparison charts. This is for the Rural Energy Savings Program because it's our favorite, we're starting with this one. But we have, what, about 10 or so posted already with more to come every two weeks in Climate Change Solutions. What is a side-by-side-by-side-by chart? Side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison chart? It compares what's in the existing law with what the House is proposing and what the Senate's proposing. It's all marked up and very, very easy to help congressional staff orient yourselves to what Congress is up to with the Farm Bill. And they are up to quite a lot. Um, today, however, we are going to discuss how we can make the most of natural climate solutions, which leverage processes like those in forests, grasslands, soils, and wetlands to reduce carbon emissions, sequester carbon, and expand economic development opportunities in rural areas. Natural climate solutions are very popular, uh, and they're a very popular strategy to address climate change. A recent survey commissioned by U.S. Nature for Climate found that 92% of people across the political spectrum support the implementation of natural climate solutions. And when we invest in natural climate solutions, we win many times over. In the realm of resilience, for example, every dollar invested in reducing our risk from disasters before they occur saves us roughly $6 in disaster response down the road. We have four amazing panelists, and they will help us understand the federal role in maximizing the multiple benefits of natural climate solutions. We'll hear about strategies and approaches that are working, what we're still learning, and what the next phase of natural climate solutions policy and implementation will look like. A key outcome of federal support in natural climate solutions is the long-term productivity and resilience of America's natural and working lands and the prosperity of rural communities. And those are all things, hopefully, we can all get behind. I'm going to progress just a little bit. Um, we have a, a survey. Um, I'm going to mention it now. We'll also come back to this at the end of the panel. If you're in our online audience, if you're in person, uh, if you have two minutes and you'd like to tell us what you're thinking about uh, today's event, please do so. We read every response, and we really do try to always find opportunities to improve. If you're in the online audience and the audio stream doesn't sound right or the video stream doesn't look right, let us know. If you have ideas for future topics, please let us know as well. 
For folks in the room, we'll have a question and answer period after our fourth panelist. If you're in our online audience, you can also ask us questions. And the way to do that is to send us an email. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at ESI.org. You can also tweet, us, uh, tweet at us online, at EESI online. And be sure to follow us on social media. Uh, we'll be doing real-time coverage of our Instagram story, X, Blue Sky, and Threads. And that brings us to the first of our four panelists today. Shannon Hike Williams leads the National Wildlife Federation's Climate and Energy Policy Program, directing and representing strategic priorities at the federal level as they relate to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, advancing wildlife responsible renewable energy, and boosting, car boosting carbon removal strategies. Shannon joined National Wildlife Federation in 2015, and before that, she worked in government relations for the Pew Charitable Trusts. She's also served as a professional staff member focusing on climate change and air quality issues for former chairman Jim Jeffords, independent of Vermont, of, and, on the, and he chaired at the time and was ranking member of the Senate Environment Public Works Committee. Shannon and I actually shared an office at EPW way back then. She's probably the only person in the room who remembers me with hair, <laughs> which is, that was a long time ago. Um, Shannon, it is so great to have you uh, on the panel today. I'll tee up your slides. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. It is a, such a kick to be here today with you and with EESI and uh, U.S. Nature for Climate and BPC. I mean, this is really a tri triumvirate of really awesome partners working on natural climate solutions and so much more uh, together. Really appreciate the invitation. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm Shannon Hike Williams. I'm Associate Vice President of Climate and Energy at National Wildlife Federation. Uh, we are a really the largest conservation membership conservation organization in the U.S. Uh, we have over six million members, as well as affiliates in every state in the U.S. plus a couple of territories. And um, our mission is to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world, which is a lot of the topic today. Um, <clears throat> and a little bit about our climate work. Um, in addition to promoting clean energy and industrial decarbonization, we also, of course, champion natural climate solutions or other nature-based solutions that restore, revitalize, and connect habitat from urban areas to wilderness, private and, and public lands, and forests, grasslands, wetlands, you name it. <laughs> These solutions can help address climate change, which we're going to talk about today. Um, but we also care as NWF because, of course, it improves habitat for wildlife. And it makes outdoor spaces more appealing, livable, and worthwhile for all people. And nature-based solutions uh, also can help advance our environmental justice goals uh, and ones that are self-identified challenges of frontline and fenceline communities by mitigation, mitigating air pollution, water pollution, addressing severe flooding, uh, increasing access to healthy foods, and a number of other benefits. All right. So uh, before we go in any deeper, time for a little definitional discussion. Uh, so what do we mean when we talk about natural climate solutions? So there, there are different uh, usages out there of these terms of natural climate solutions, nature-based solutions. Um, but I'll share the ones that we use at NWF, uh, which are also the ones used by the Department of Interior. So first, uh, nature-based solutions are actions that incorporate natural features or processes to protect, conserve, restore, sustainably use and manage natural or modified uh, natural ecosystems to address socio-environmental challenges while providing measurable co-benefits. Now, natural climate solutions, a subset of nature-based solutions, are really ones that store carbon. Um, that's their main purpose. And or avoid greenhouse gas emissions while providing additional co-benefits. And when we talk about co-benefits, what do we mean? So certainly there's economic co-benefits, which we'll hear about today. Uh, but also for an organization like mine, uh, co-benefits are really about the cumulative positive impacts on human well-being, on ecosystem health, biodiversity resulting from nature-based solutions implementation. But today's briefing really does focus mainly on natural climate solutions as a mean means to address and mitigate climate change um, and that excess carbon dioxide that is fueling uh, the crisis. So I'll focus mostly here. But I will return briefly at the end of my presentation to talking about some of the adaptation and resilience benefits of nature-based solutions as well. So, uh, so are all natural climate solutions the same? No. <laughs> there, there are actually sort of three main categories you could think of when trying to uh, determine sort of the, the role of these types of strategies in addressing climate change. 
uh, the, ranging on the screen here from the, the least amount of human intervention and the lowest cost to the greatest on the bottom of the screen. We start with avoided emissions and protection of, of ecosystems. So protection, obviously, as is, roughly as is, is basically an immediate and significant way to reduce emissions and provide enormous co-benefits. Uh, slightly more involved in terms of human intervention would be improved stewardship or management of lands or of resources. And benefits from improved management can be easier to achieve um, than restoration, which is our next category and the most involved, and one usually requiring the most uh, resources economically and otherwise. Uh, restoration of native habitats have the most potential uh, in terms of kind of untapped ability to sequester even more carbon to help fight climate change. But benefits might be a little bit more delayed, of course, than just protecting existing ecosystems. And it can be more expensive and require more person hours uh, and other resources than just managing existing carbon sinks. So, so how do you know when to tackle these different strategies? It depends. Uh, different strategies are preferable in different kinds of landscapes, depending on their condition, potential for soaking up more carbon. Uh, it must be balanced against not only other needs, but increasingly also against the potential for increased risk from climate change itself. So in other words, um, it's important to remember that while protecting an intact forest may be the quickest way to plan for carbon storage, Changing climatic conditions may make that untouched forest more vulnerable to megafires and loss, uh, right, that could put that carbon sink at risk. Not to mention its other values for wildlife habitat, clean water, timber, and, and more. So sometimes management of a forest resource is actually better at preserving the viability of a forest sink than simply protecting it in a changing climate. And then in terms of restoration of native habitat, uh, it can achieve a number of wins uh, in addition to increasing carbon uptake. It can create jobs, a lot of jobs, that can't be outsourced, if you think about it. Um, it builds, of course, habitat and provides greater resilience to extreme weather. Uh, fortunately, there's been lots of good investment in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act and this kind of activity, though, of course, a lot more is needed in order to really uh, realize the full potential that restoration activities have. Okay, so how much are we talking about here? <laughs> how, how good is the, are these types of strategies in addressing climate change and soaking up carbon? So this is where I, I insert a caveat that, that I find it very hard to find solid numbers about that are consistent across um, even the same types of landscapes in different settings. There's a lot of different independent literature out there and a, and a lot of it increasingly getting much stronger. Um, but there's not a sort of a one-stop shop for the best, most detailed, updated numbers on carbon storage and potential carbon storage from each of these types of uh, landscapes. So with that <laughs> caveat in mind, I will say, though, that, that the data that we do have shows enormous potential. Um, even though estimates vary some, it's generally uh, thought that natural climate solutions live to their fullest potential could one day uh, reduce U.S. emissions across the economy by 30 percent. So that, that's not anything to sneeze at. Um, for comparison, today's forests absorb about 11 percent of our country's greenhouse gas emissions. Also very significant. We're in an era of addressing climate change where we really have to look at everything in the toolbox to try to get emissions stabilized and our climate stabilized. So 11% may not right off the bat sound like a huge number, but when you have to look at each of the different wedges of the solution set, then it's, it's actually pretty significant. Clearly, natural climate solutions are not a panacea for addressing climate change, but they're definitely a significant tool and shouldn't be overlooked. And to date, a lot of it has been overlooked. Um, on the screen, you can check out the, the, the uh, papers here if you, if you so desire and check out those statistics. Just have that there as examples of some of the significant benefits and more on adaptation and resilience benefits to come uh, in, a, in just a minute. So another thing to emphasize, um, especially as a wildlife organization, is that trees are not always the answer. <laughs> um, it's tempting because trees are such great carbon suckers, if you will, uh, to just, you know, perhaps we should just have trees planted everywhere. Uh, but this is just, uh, even though that sounds promising by way of CO2 potential, we really need to try to avoid carbon tunnel vision as much as possible when designing policy. What I mean by that is carbon sequestration efforts really must be compatible with other ecological values. So, so forests may be excellent carbon sinks, but afforestation isn't always appropriate. 
Afforestation, what I mean by that is it's the planting of trees uh, where forests didn't really exist before, or if they did, it was such a long time ago that it's essentially you know, not recent history. Um, planting, why that might not be good is planting trees, for example, in native grasslands, <laughs> uh, jeopardizes ecosystems or wildlife uh, that may be fragile and might already be facing other pressures from development or climate change. So often what we, what we really advocate for is climate smart reforestation as the goal. So restoring uh, previously forested spaces with native species and with uh, climate change and our changing future in mind. Uh, so, so replanting or reforesting with an idea for what is resilient and able to withstand change. An exception to this rule of thumb might be a you know, severely degraded landscape that, such as like an abandoned mine land perhaps uh, where the land is so severely degraded that it, it really isn't possible to return it to its native state from before extraction, but there, ha there might be perhaps some other you know, vegetation or other approaches that could be made that still have environmental benefits. Okay, and then just a brief word on urban forests. This is a category that I sometimes think of as, as really squarely in both the natural climate solutions and nature-based solutions camps. Um, because the, you know, if you see the number here, the potential for absorbing carbon is quite large and already is a very large carbon sink uh, across the US for uh, uh, trees just you know, in cities all across America. But, um, but often urban tree cover is expanded not for carbon reasons, right? There's so many more immediate benefits from this, uh, from this strategy. And usually increasing tree cover has more sought after benefits like improving our city's livability, uh, managing stormwater, cleaning the air, providing cooling and shade. There's been a lot of studies on that. that it can actually lower the, the uh, uh, overall temperature in cities and providing wildlife habitat, of course. And there's even been studies that have shown that urban tree cover can be associated with uh, reduced incidence of crime in certain cities, which is very exciting. Okay, so I mentioned I would return to this. Um, there are also the very overlapping, but not entirely the same, identical, uh, strategies called nature-based solutions. They're really close cousins of, of uh, natural climate solutions. But these are undertaken uh, primarily with the purpose of protecting people, uh, resources, wildlife, property from the impacts of climate change or for helping people and nature adapt to those changes. So carbon sequestration with these strategies might be a co-benefit. Many studies now show, and you probably have heard of, of these, uh, these things called living shorelines, which are essentially constructed uh, coastal protections made up of natural materials like oyster shells, uh, sand, rocks, plants, that can manage storm surge and sea level rise often more effectively and certainly more flexibly than hardened or gray infrastructure, uh, potentially with additional water and other benefits as well. So by designing policies and projects that look at both carbon sequestering and resilience boosting benefits, you can make sure every dollar goes even further. And as Dan mentioned earlier, um, every, for every $1 spent on risk reduction activities, the United States actually saves $6 in, in disaster costs, producing huge savings for taxpayers and insurance uh, holders over the long term. So ideally, we can plan for both climate mitigation and, adap and adaptation at the same time. And then one brief word uh, just on another policy theme of carbon dioxide removal. It's very popular on the Hill and is something we also work on at NWF. How is that related to natural climate solutions? So, so in my mind, uh, carbon dioxide removal is really the purposeful human activity, uh, whether it's technological, natural, or some hybrid of the two, that takes excess CO2 out of the atmosphere for the sake of the climate. It, it might have other co-benefits, but it's really a climate strategy. And then the CO2 is then either intentionally stored deeply underground, and I mean deep, <laughs> like a mile deep, um, or in vegetation or soils, or sometimes even converted into other useful products like cement, which is really cool. Um, it's not simply about leaving nature alone to perform sequestration activities, uh, because new carbon uptake, uptake is really the goal. So in other words, what's really important to remember in that second bullet about, uh, about carbon dioxide removal is that it really should be uh, permanent, additional, verifiable, and enforceable and that's not always something we can say about every type of natural climate solution, at least not yet. But where data is robust on the carbon sequestering benefits of natural climate solutions, it certainly could be part of CDR-related policy, 
Um, I might suggest that where it's less so, then maybe it's not quite time to say monetize it through uh, as, a, as a CDR policy. So that's, that's it in a nutshell for me. Um, I hope that I was able to show for you today at least an introductory sense of how natural climate solutions are scalable, proven, and deliver wins for communities and wildlife, and certainly our climate. Um, and if you'd like to read more about NWF's policy positions and recommendations, uh, there's a link there. We have a policy platform with more detail. And thanks very much. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. That was a great, pretty good nutshell, I got to say. Um, Shannon had some great slides. Our other presenters have great slides. Um, there are printed slides out on the front table. If you are here and you want to grab some, you can also access uh, the materials on our website, www.esi.org. And there are also a lot of other materials uh, posted on the briefing webpage as well, so lots of good stuff um, there. Um, also, just a reminder, if you came in a little late, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. If you're in person, we'll have a microphone. If you're in our online audience, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, uh, at ESI.org. Shannon mentioned a couple things, just to never miss an opportunity to plug ESI resources. We actually had a briefing a couple weeks ago featuring uh, Joel um, Pennell from American Forests uh, talking about small and medium-sized city climate solutions. And if you want to learn more about uh, urban forestry, Joel's presentation, Esteban, you remember that one? You were there. Um, you, that's a great presentation. You might want to go back and check out. Joel is a, a great, great speaker. And then also, we did the ocean carbon dioxide removal briefing a while about, ago. We're going to do another CDR briefing, I think it's September. And so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we'll be, um, it'll be a really, really good one. That brings us to our second panelist of the day. Jennifer Nelligan is the Chief Program Officer at the National Association of Conservation Districts. In this role, uh, Jennifer oversees its conservation programs and grants, partnerships, government affairs, and communications. She's an experienced consultant and founded, um, I sh no, I'm gonna do it, Alethea, yes, advisors prior to joining the National Association of Conservation Districts. Jen also served as a contracting officer with the U.S. Naval Sea Systems Command. Jennifer, thanks so much for being here. I'll welcome you to the lectern, and your slides are ready to go. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So, um, is this going to stay? All right, cool. So before I get started, how many of you are familiar with conservation districts? Oh, good. More than I thought. I was going to, I was hoping that you guys wouldn't break my heart. <laughs> So for those of you that aren't familiar with conservation districts, well, first, NACD represents them. There are about 3,000 across the country. Um, we Districts are local units of government that are authorized to support working lands conservation in about 57 states and territories. Um, working lands, for those of you, um, I, I think sometimes um, the definition gets a little bit fuzzy, um, but we think about working lands as managed areas and that they can be public or private. Um, some of these are often used for ag, farming, right, ranching, forestry products, um, but not all of working lands necessarily produce um, a specific commodity, right? Some of them provide ecosystem services that can benefit wildlife, habitat, and um, recreation, and so on. And so when NRCS um, was established as a soil erosion service back in 1933, um, it, they quickly realized that the federal government can't come in and tell farmers how to farm. Not much has changed in 100 years, right? <laughs> we still can't do that. So the first conservation district was established in 1937 as the local voice and the local arm to make sure that the community's voices were represented in developing the natural resource um, or addressing the natural resource concerns that are appropriate for them. Um, so each district is managed by a board that's comprised of members from the community that are elected by the community. And so this concept of locally led conservation is really, really critical for us. Um, in order to be effective, we also believe that conservation has to be voluntary, incentive based and economically viable. Um, but I want to dig into the concept of locally led because this is a really important component of Farm Bill conservation policies and programs. Um, so each community that we work within, right, is very, very different. They have incredibly different needs, climate, physiographic characteristics, demographics, and challenges, right? We have conservation districts from really urban areas like San Diego all the way up to really remote rural areas up in Alaska and from the territories from Guam and Puerto Rico and everything in between. Um, we worked with medium and large farms in production ag, but we also work with really small diversified farmers. 
Um, I know that it's so important, right, when we think about the scale that's needed to feed, clothe, and fuel the world, essentially, right? But I think it's really important for us to remember that it's these small producers that play a huge role in food security. Um, a lot of folks tend to think, well, maybe that's an urban issue, but I guarantee you that it's not. Um, conservation districts work with small producers across the country um, that really support um, food security in rural and remote areas as well. Um, it's kind of like that adage, right? Like water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Um, there are lots of farm communities as well that um, really face food um, insecurity and have limited access to fresh and nutritious foods. So as I had mentioned, our origins were really based in the Dust Bowl, and so soil health has always been a priority for us. Um, but as you all know here today, and as you had mentioned and some of my other colleagues will talk about, soil health continues to be a priority for us. Um, and that's because it's one of the largest terrestrial sinks that we have. Um, there are incredible investments across the private and public sectors to improve soil health and leverage nature-based solutions to mitigate climate change. And while sequestering greenhouse gases is, of course, a critical priority, I think we need to remember a few things when we think about carbon programs. Um, so today, a lot of the on-farm carbon interventions focus on three main practices. That tends to be cover crop, reduced or no-till, as well as nutrient management. Um, they're incredibly important, don't get me wrong, and they have really, really big impacts on the environment. Um, but I think it's important for us to remember that those aren't the only climate solutions or nature-based solutions out there. Um, these, con um, these conservation practices don't necessarily work for all producers, and not all producers are able to participate in these programs. Um, so NRCS, of course, has a really long list of climate smart ag and forestry practices that they continue to expand. Um, and we like to remind our members that NRCS is always um, willing and able to accept the data and research to continue to expand those lists. But I think also just kind of zooming back out, right, with the incredible diversity that we have across the country, we do have to recognize that there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution to conservation. Um, the, the strategies that we take to improve soil health and sequester carbon will look different on a farm in the Midwest versus a ranch in New Mexico. And um, this is even from the Marianas Islands out in Rota. And you can kind of see that instead of mulch, they're actually using coconut shells, right, because that's what's readily available. And that's what's native, and that covers the soil and protects the roots. So it looks very, very different across the board. Um, but even, you know, those are kind of extreme examples, but as you all know, even within the same farm and track, the conservation solutions might look very, very different for a producer. And of course, as you had mentioned, it's really not just about our farms and ranchers, but the forests, grasslands, and other landscapes that need active management. Um, the Reflation Induction Act has um, provided historical investments to scale conservation practices and nature-based solutions. Um, but the bottom line here is that conservation programs do need to be flexible so that they're inclusive and that they address a wide range of natural resource concerns across the country. So in other words, getting back to that first principle that we have, right, these solutions have to be locally led and fit the needs of that community. Um, of, where am I? Of course, carbon's just one of the many natural resource concerns and priorities that we have. Um, water quality and quantity are also really critical ecosystem services. There are lots of programs and credits coming on board that look at developing incentives today and credits that yield better water outcomes. Program and markets Sorry, I think I skipped forward a couple more. My bad. Um, forest and, uh, sorry, programs and markets are also looking at biodiversity standards and credits. Um, I think folks are really still trying to define what exactly that means, but we do see them coming online within the next several years. So from a conservation planning perspective, we do need to take a look at the land and the producer's needs holistically. Um, that means you have to consider what's ecologically appropriate and what the ecosystem service trade-offs are when you're developing the best solutions and plans. So um, prescribed burns are a great example where, yes, that does release some carbon, but it's a lot less than these massive wildfires that we've been seeing in the past several years, and that's a trade-off. Um, you had talked about even ecological sensitive trees, right, where when we look in the grasslands and the sage grouse uh, biomes, um, unmanaged invasive trees are not appropriate and do need to be removed. Um, and so 
I, I just kind of wanted to give a nod to the Working Lands for Wildlife Framework. Um, that is NRCS's, and we're a really big fan of how they approach um, landscape scale conservation because they take a data-driven approach to take a look at where the need is most critical, where that protection needs to be, and then they coalesce all the partners, landowners, and also financial resources in order to really target that sort of conservation. Um, and that kind of begets a question, right? If we're really looking at conservation at this landscape scale, then why do we focus so much on individual producers and farmers? And that's because about 60% of the land in the US is privately owned and about 40% is farmland. So this has huge, huge impacts on the environment and it takes it takes influencing and reaching out to each of these individuals to convince them to do something different on their lands, and that is no easy feat. I think it's also important that we recognize that 88% of farmers are small family farms. They, are, um, they contribute to about 20% of the production value, and what that means is that they mostly have other jobs in order to sustain farming. Um, about 30% of farmers are new and beginner farmers, and 10% are under the age of 35. And so really, what we're trying to say with all this math is that we can't understate the importance of outreach, education, and technical assistance. Um, in order to serve producers, help them through this process, and achieve these landscape goals, there are no shortcuts. It takes time, it takes trust building, and it takes expertise. Um, so I'll take one example, right? Cover crops are a very common climate solution today, right? Um, and, and it's not a very simple thing. You can't just say, yeah, it's okay. You can just go ahead and plant cover crops, right? What kind? Right? And that varies based on the soil you have, based on the weather, water access, and so on. Um, when do you uh, terminate it? How do you terminate it? Um, and these aren't really simple questions. This comes with a level of trial and error, and all of that comes at a risk and a cost to producers. And without technical assistance and technical assistance dollars, we aren't able to do that in a really effective and impactful way. Um, so a very quick plug, uh, NACD did request um, $1.2 billion in FY25 technical assistance dollars. And um, we did submit a letter to Congress and had about 80 agricultural and um, conservation groups sign on. So we're really excited about that. And we're really looking forward to the coming discussions on the FY25 appropriations. So while everyone wants to be good stewards of their lands, um, the reality is with 88% of producers being small and having multiple jobs, um, every decision comes at a cost and every cost is a trade-off. And that trade-off can be between implementing a conservation plan or practice, sending your kids to school, paying a mortgage, buying new supplies, equipment, and so on. Those are really big decisions. And so when we look at financial assistance programs that are offered through the conservation um, title of the Farm Bill, these are incredibly important and incredibly impactful. Um, in just 20, FY23, so these are the IRA funds, so not even just your regular Farm Bill dollars, NRCS received 11,550 applications from producers interested in implementing climate smart practices they were only able to fund about 45%. Um, there is incredible demand from producers out there and incredible need as well. Um, and so as we're thinking about farm bill negotiations today, oh, I am way off of time. <laughs> as we're thinking about um, IRA today, right, our top priority is to integrate that into the baseline, into conservation programs, and quickly too, right, because as NRCS continues to spend down in IRA, that's less funding that's able to be incorporated into the baseline. Um, I only have a minute left, so I'm really going to fly through these slides. You can ask me questions later. Um, but NACD, over the past couple of years, had um, partnered with the Soil Health Institute to study the economics of um, soil health practices on about 30 farms. And what we did find is that on average, net farm income increased by an average of $65 per acre. And that's largely driven by reduced expenses and, in many cases, yield increases. Um, but conservation has additional economic benefits, and that is in land value. So these are just a few examples from um, a few states, and you can see the sources below. But there are significant differences in the rental rates and the average value per acre when there are um, high-quality lands and high-quality farmlands versus ones that have lower, um, uh, sorry, 
lower characteristics. And so just to kind of wrap up here, you know, what we had kind of shared, right? Um, we talked a little bit about what is locally led conservation and why that's so important for policy. We talked about how important incentives are in order for producers to be able to implement these practices. But one last thing, it has to be economically viable, right? And so um, we see that through the value of the land, through some of the um, reduced expenses. But there also needs to be a long-term market for climate smart commodities. So we are very, very excited about what USDA is doing with the partnership for climate smart commodities and also where those projects will go in the next several years. Um, we're seeing a lot of collaboration across the supply chain to um, implement more nature-based solutions and reward farmers for the work that they're doing. Um, I think that these investments, the $3.1 billion investments, will go a long way and we're really excited to see what that means from a market perspective. Um, also, just a quick plug, we are not done when we're just implementing conservation practices, right? It's so incredibly important that we're also developing the next generation of conservationists. So NACD is really proud to be a partner with the Working Lands Climate Corps um, with NRCS, the Core Network, and AmeriCorps. Um, in the inaugural year, there will be about 125 participants that will have high-paying jobs that are delivering technical assistance across the country and helping producers to implement these nature-based solutions. Um, and there are other programs like the Envirothon, which are for K through 12 competitions, um, as well as our Next Generation Leadership Institute. But all of these investments in the next generation are also critically important so that we can continue to scale these practices and achieve the environmental and climate outcomes that we're looking for. Thank you. Here's your name tent. Great. Well, now everyone has to think of lots of good questions, so we can come back to some of the things that maybe Jennifer had to skip over a little bit. Um, our third presenter today is Carrie Kostka. Carrie joined the Nature Conservancy in Idaho in 2019 to lead the chapter's policy and advocacy efforts aimed at building partnerships for conservation policy and public funding. Carrie <clears throat> serves as the government relations point at both the federal and state levels and oversees management of the chapter's climate program. Before joining TNC, Carrie spent 10 years with the state of Idaho serving as strategic planning manager for the Idaho Department of Lands and policy analyst for the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Carrie, thank you so much for visiting us today from Idaho. Really looking forward to your presentation. I'll, I'll get it keyed up for you. Okay, am I doing this right? <laughs> Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I think this is going to have a little bit different flavor than maybe the last couple of presentations. Um, going to be really locally focused and project focused. Um, but I'm really excited to feature a successful collaborative natural climate solutions project that's touching down in Idaho. Um, and where the Nature Conservancy, of which I'm a part of, um, is a partner to this collaboration. So before we tee up a short video for you, I want to emphasize that natural climate solutions are important. They're just so critical in every state, but they're especially important in states like Idaho where two thirds of land is publicly owned and administered by the US Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management and other agencies. And studies by the Nature Conservancy have shown that natural climate solutions to protect, better manage and restore forests, grasslands and wetlands uh, could contribute a to a third of the emissions reductions we need to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And importantly, natural climate solutions offer immediate and cost-effective ways to take climate action now while providing support for urban and rural communities. So to highlight these benefits, I'd like to share with you the City of Trees challenge. And first, we'll tee up a short video. Trees for me have always been a lifelong love. One of my favorite spots as a child was up in one of those trees. It was just magical to be in the middle of the city and yet in the middle of nature. I want to make sure that every neighborhood in Boise has that same opportunity. I'm Elaine Clegg. I'm the city council president for the city of Boise and the sponsor of the City of Trees Challenge. The City of Trees Challenge is an initiative to plant a tree for every household in the city of Boise and a seedling for every resident in a forest nearby. We've got to act now if we're going to 
really impact climate change. And trees are such an important part of that. As a first step, we did a tree canopy study using aerial photography. You literally count every tree, then using a tree equity score that was developed by the American Forest based on socioeconomic data. We could identify which neighborhoods most needed trees. Making sure that all of our residents have an equal quality of life is such an important thing. Trees have so many benefits. The bigger a tree grows, the more carbon it sequesters. It cleans the air. The shade also helps with the heat. We're hoping to double the tree canopy, but we needed people on the ground, and so we started the Tree Captains Project. This one right here. My job as a tree captain is looking for neighborhoods that don't have as many trees, knocking on doors, talking to people about their yard. By having trees for free, it's a pretty easy sell. The city is also providing education on maintaining trees. I work with them and the residents to create a plan that will help their trees survive and look great. Rural and urban are really codependent. The fires and the insects have been impacting Boise National Forest. This is a way for the city residents to give back to the forest that they enjoy so much. This initiative has been successful because of many partners, including the Treasure Valley Canopy Network, the Boise National Forest, and the Nature Conservancy. I hope Boise can model for other cities how to create a great place to live in the face of climate change with access to the natural world that we all thrive in. So City Council Chairman, Chairwoman Clegg, whom you saw in the video, um, outlined this vision. She's been working on this for a number of years. Her vision was to plant an urban tree for every household in the city and to plant a forest seedling for every resident in the nearby Boise National Forest by the year 2030 as a way for Boise to take climate action and bring a multitude of benefits to the local community and beyond. The collaboration needed for this project features well in a state like Idaho, where we have a long history of collaborative forest management across the state. We have a unique Idaho roadless rule. Um, we've modeled through local forest collaboratives. We've been early adopters of the Good Neighbor Authority and shared stewardship and a number of other programs in forest management. For this project in particular, the challenge benefited from um, partners with the US Forest Service, the Arbor Day Foundation, the Treasure Valley Canopy Network, which you saw, um, the Idaho Conservation Corps, City of Good, the Nature Conservancy, and more. And I'm sorry, I meant to click ahead on the slides. Is it going to play now? <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, also, a variety of resources have been critical to include. Include many, many, many hours of um, volunteer hours, contributions from community-based businesses who supplied materials and labor and both public and private funding. And funders have included the City of Boise, the Arbor Day Foundation, and other nonprofits. We're also leveraging private philanthropy, and this shows up in a number of our forest programs in Idaho. But after reading um, a, a short article on this project in a Nature Conservancy newsletter, uh, we actually had a donor reach out and donate $50,000 directly to the project because he was excited to see a local effort um, with direct impacts um, being taken directly locally. So um, just really exciting to leverage these different types of funding. And then recently, one of the partners, the Treasure Valley Canopy Network, was awarded nearly $1.1 million in a community forestry grant from the U.S. Forest Service to expand this program beyond Boise to the full Treasure Valley is the, is the greater Boise area. And this uh, challenge is really meeting the goals of the community forestry program. It's contributing to clean air, quality of life um, for those most in need, increased property values, and reduced urban heat. We're already celebrating successes um, for uh, some early successes, I should say, for this project, which was slated to be completed by 2030. The 100,000 urban trees planted, one for every Boise household, remains in progress across the city. This is a much larger arm of the effort. Um, we have 16,000 trees planted to date. And last month, we actually completed the forest seedling plantings on the Boise National Forest. So one seedling for every Boise household. Uh, we planted 235,000 seedlings. And this was a 10-year goal, I'm sorry, this was a 10-year goal that we accomplished in just four years. Uh, we were able to celebrate recently too with some of our collaborate, collaborators and um, the Chief of the Forest Service visited us as well, as well last month. So I'd like to highlight just a bit more on the forest side of the equation, um, which is a really key piece in states like Idaho. 
So drought, disease, wildfire, smoke, among other disasters, have direct impacts on nearby communities, as we know, and even these smoke impacts can travel much further. Uh, we rely on these forests for clean air and water, recreation, economic needs, and more. The Pioneer Fire, which you can see part of the burn scar in that left-hand photo, started in July of 2016 and burned 180,000 acres over three months. This is not uncommon in a state like Idaho, but it is quite large. Um, and as most of you know, smoke and associated health impacts from fires like these are immense. So now led by the Nature Conservancy in Idaho and the Forest Service, the City of Trees Challenge um, has focused on planting seedlings in um, these areas, lands that were damaged by the fire. Um, and while many of these lands burned extremely hot, as you can kind of see, there's not a lot of shelter wood or other seed stock available there, and it will take a very long time to regrow or regenerate naturally. So we're focusing our reforestation efforts in these types of landscapes. Along with reducing greenhouse gas, excuse me, greenhouse gases and sequestering carbon, as these seedlings grow, they will improve wildlife habitat, help improve water quality, and help the land heal from impacts of the fire. Ensuring these forests recover and grow means that they will continue to provide opportunities to current and future generations. In both wildland and urban settings, to have this lasting climate impact that we're talking about, these durable solutions, the right trees must be planted in the right place for the right reason. And so this collaboration really focuses on that. Ways to plan, ways to plant, and ways to care for the trees over their, life, over their lifespan. And the challenges combination of urban and rural tree planting provides a model for scaling community-driven climate action nationwide. I like hearing Jennifer is locally based. You know, we need support, we need incentive based, we need local buy-in, and this is exactly that model. We actually have other communities that are working to adopt this model um, and trying to plant more trees, uh, mostly um, using funding for the 1.5 billion for urban and community forest product projects that was included in the Inflation Reduction Act. And most of you likely aren't familiar with Idaho, but cities of Haley, Malad, Nampa, Pocatello, Rexburg, and so Soda Springs, just in Idaho, have received more than $6 million for this type of effort. So why talk about this project here today? I know it's a little bit different flavor. It's much more localized. Um, but simply put, congressional support for pragmatic solutions leading to healthy forests makes projects like the City of Trees Challenge possible. It really wouldn't happen without appropriate policies and funding. And there's a huge, huge, huge gap. So on national forest lands, only 6% of post-wildfire planting needs are met annually. 6%. We're not regrowing the national forests that are you know, subject to some of these severe fires and other threats at a scale that's really meaningful. Congress has supported critical wins for our nation's forests, including the wildfire funding fix in 2018, which allows us to do more than just wildfire suppression. Um, we saw the bipartisan infrastructure law in 2021 that include, included programs like the Replant Act that allow for significant increases in post-fire restoration and tree planting on national forests. But there's still more for Congress to do, more for us to do. Capacity is one of the biggest gaps capacity in the forest service and supply chain to keep expanding reforestation work. This includes workforce capacity, seed production, nursery capacity, and related infrastructure. And there are also needs for private sector workforce and grants and contracts to support and augment the forest service. As we know, many of these new programs and funding are going to be implemented through cooperating partners, such as the Nature Conservancy or other nonprofits. And I'll add investment in reforestation on private lands is needed. We cannot accomplish this just by tackling the federal lands alone. So again, trees are one of the best tools we have. You've heard it talked about here. Um, and resilient forests are one of the best natural climate solutions. Growing more resilient forests that will help address the wildfire crisis, sequester carbon, and enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services is complementary. Um, to other NCS efforts you've heard talked about here today, and to efforts to reduce emissions from energy, transportation, and industry. So I'll thank you uh, for letting me talk to you today and share about this project. And thank you for all the work you do, too, on the policies and resources necessary to grow this work. So sorry, someone else's. Um, I'll stop there and look forward to questions.
That was great. That was an awesome video too. Thank you so much. Um, if you'd like to go back and revisit any of the presenta presentations so far, all of the um, slides and things are posted on our webpage, on the briefing webpage. You can also go back and watch uh, the briefing after it's posted. You can go visit our YouTube page. And if you want to, um, uh, so everything will be there. And eventually, it'll take us a couple weeks, but we'll also have some summary notes. So if you want to come back to this in the future, but maybe don't want to have to watch the whole thing to find, to find one of the nuggets that our presenters had. Um, there's still time for questions. Um, if you are in our online audience, you can submit questions uh, to us by email. And the email address to use is ask. That's ask at aesi.org. And we're getting a bunch. So thanks so much for, for folks submitting. Um, our fourth and uh, final presenter today is Leslie Jantarosmi. Um, Leslie is the, yes, uh, sorry, crossed that out for some reason. J Leslie is the managing director of the energy program at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and she brings over 12 years of policy experience at the state and federal levels. Uh, Leslie leads BPC's research and policy efforts on sectoral decarbonization strategies and standards, including focus areas on natural climate solutions, coincidence, you're here today, uh, carbon markets, clean energy po uh, policy, and natural gas's role in the energy transmission. She's also worked at the Oregon Department of Energy and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Leslie, welcome to the briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Hey, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Let me put this here. And we'll try to keep this to 10 minutes because I know we want to save ample time for the conversation here today. But my role here on this panel is to wrap things up with a discussion of where do we go now? We've just learned all of this great information about natural climate solutions, why it's important, why we want to pursue these as part of our climate strategy portfolio. Um, but what are the policy tools available to do this? And so just a little bit about us. So Bipartisan Policy Center and the energy program specifically we're looking at opportunities um, to you know, use the policy to promote health, security, and opportunity for all Americans. And so we launched about three years ago our Farm and Forest Carbon Solutions Initiative because we saw the opportunity to bring together agriculture, forestry, rural, climate-focused constituencies around this shared agenda for what is possible with nature-based solutions and natural climate solutions. And so we already heard the why, why, why this is important. We know the science is there. It's strong. It's getting stronger every day. Um, and we see this as an opportunity for cultivating that broad stakeholder support um, and you know, all of the benefits that come with investment in natural climate solutions. And so we were really lucky enough when we launched a task force uh, looking at these issues to have former Senators Saxby Chambliss and Heidi Heitkamp agree to co-chair um, this group of 18 experts from across a variety of industries and perspectives, and this actually includes Shannon's boss, uh, NWF president and CEO. Um, so we're super excited to work with this group of people to develop a comprehensive set of 24 policy recommendations designed to move the needle on this issue area. Um, but, you know, the work that we were doing obviously wasn't happening in a vacuum. And, you know, over the past four years, it's been an incredibly productive kind of legislation period with four major climate and policy, energy and climate policy wins happening in these different areas. And you think about this kind of set of, of issues as, oh, this is, this is something for energy and climate, or it's infrastructure focused, or it's tax credit focused. But, but really, when you dig down into the actual provisions and look through all of these things, and we've heard a couple of folks already mention you know, the different uh, programs and funding streams that came from these laws that um, you know, touch on issues uh, relevant for natural climate solutions. We're seeing a ton in the agricultural, climate smart agriculture and forestry space. We see a lot on resilience and kind of uh, landscape scale um, investment throughout. And so the, the provisions here, they also touch both um, public lands management issues as well as working with private landowners and ensuring that we have the research capabilities and the technical assistance available to do these practices properly. So that's great. We did that. Um, but where do we go next? And what are the actual levers to potentially pull for getting additional work done on natural climate solutions? So you know, kind of breaking it down in a very simplistic way here, we got Congress, um, which is great. You're all here today at this congressional briefing. We also have the executive branch agencies that are really involved in a lot of these, uh, uh, especially on the implementation side. And so what 
obviously I think people are here most, you know, most recently thinking of is legislative opportunities that are upcoming. And Farm Bill is one of the key ones um, that come to mind. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. But I also wanted to give a shout out, and I also heard my fellow panelists talk about the importance of appropriations. This is an opportunity to pass legislation that comes up every year related to budgets, right? And so there are opportunities to invest in the types of programs and in the, the kind of uh, institutional infrastructure that allows nature-based solutions um, to get, get the support um, that the on-the-ground folks that are doing the work actually need. Uh, so we also see this and then on the executive side when we have the actual appropriations passed, we have agencies involved in delivery of these programs. Um, and this could be, you know, these are just a few examples from USDA, but there are lots of other agencies uh, involved in um, the you know, implementation of programs for, to, in support of natural climate solutions. And so the uh, decisions and the types of programs that um, give out grants or you know, formula funding that flows through states, a lot of the details and how that work gets done is, has a lot of discretion at the agency or department level. So um, can't forget how important that is. There's also a regulatory piece that could potentially be leveraged. There are authorities given to USDA, FDA, EPA, for example, that you know, have uh, you know, some relevance, could touch on some opportunities to enhance nature-based solutions. And then uh, we also want to include the ability of the president to influence this policy agenda through executive orders. And so there are things that you know, we saw in, in, under this administration related to climate change in general, but also some specific executive orders related to forestry, for example. And so there, there are opportunities to um, harness momentum and really give direction to federal agencies and how they implement their uh, program authorities in service of a uh, presidential um, goal. And so some of the key federal entities here, this is just kind of a, a, a rough breakdown, but many of the usual uh, entities that you think of when you think of um, nat natural resource management or you know, public lands management, so the Department of Interior is a hugely important player here with all of the agencies underneath of it. We have the USDA, of course, that they're primarily focused on nature-based solutions uh, within the private lands space, but the US Forest Service, I would say, is the, the biggest um, exception to that, where they have direct um, authority and influence and responsibility to implement um, forest-based uh, practices. And then just a handful of other kind of other agencies, independent agencies and other, other departments, um, and the, some of these were mentioned already today. So lots of folks uh, have you know, a piece of the puzzle when it comes to how do we advance natural climate solutions. Our task force looked at different opportunities and prioritized where we thought we could get the most bang for the buck in terms of scaling public and private investments in natural climate solutions while also addressing the barriers that are stopping people from choosing to implement these practices on their lands. And so we did have a little bit more of a focus on the private uh, landowner side of things, but there were some recommendations that crossed over both that are, are relevant for both public lands management as well as private. And so these are kind of the six priority areas that you're seeing, um, both for uh, conservation in agricultural systems as well as forest systems and grasslands. Uh, we focused a lot on some of the opportunities for new finance to flow to these areas to overcome you know, what, what is the basic economics of how do we ensure that we can pay for these practices and get um, folks ready. And so one of the ways here that I wanted to dive into is on the voluntary carbon market. And so the, um, the task force had some suggestions related to uh, the ability of agriculture and forestry uh, stakeholders and landowners to participate in this market. And so this is a big deal because it brings in private finance opportunities where uh, globally, this, this is a, a recent report that just came out from Ecosystem Marketplace that looks at the size of the market globally. And we see a lot of growing interest in uh, voluntary carbon credits. And, you know, some of it has reduced in recent years, but it's still a figure that's, that's growing and is larger than any since 2021. And within those, you know, we're seeing of all the project types that generate voluntary carbon credits, 
nature-based credits are currently selling for the, the most. Uh, they are commanding higher prices than other types of projects. So that's an exciting development where it also you know, kind of begs the question, so what's the role then of the federal government? This is a market that exists you know, to bring in private capital in you know, the, the conversation around nature-based credits. But um, Congress, a couple of years ago, passed the Growing Climate Solutions Act. This was a bipartisan bill that, that my organization advocated for. And you know, this, this creates a role for the USDA in helping to um, helping farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners kind of understand and, and provide that technical assistance to, to uh, create better avenues for accessing the voluntary carbon market. And so there's a couple of requirements of what they're um, uh, doing. And actually, USDA just released an RFI kind of um, talking about and trying to get public input into how they design their program. So they're, they're really taking the steps today to implement um, the authorities given to them under the Growing Climate Solutions Act. So there's more to come on just exactly how that looks. But overall, there's also federal government interest and growing policy interest in ensuring that a, any kind of voluntary carbon market is, is both strong and, and um, you know, creates that environmental and climate benefit. And so we, on both sides of, of a functioning market, we need a robust supply and we need a robust demand. And so uh, with, with, on both sides of these things, we're, we're seeing some opportunities for policy to kind of shore up some of the, the problem areas that have been um, kind of plaguing the, the scale and development of the voluntary carbon market. And so we're um, excited that the, the federal government uh, just recently has, has issued a statement or um, kind of a joint uh, agreement amongst a couple of agencies, so the White House, the Department of Energy, the Treasury, and um, uh, one other agency, is uh, <laughs> uh, in, the, in this joint statement of policy and principles around a high integrity voluntary carbon market. And then similarly, the Commodity Futures uh, Trading Commission has regulatory oversight over certain financial products derived from voluntary carbon credits. And so they have also issued proposed, proposed guidance, so this, this is using their regulatory authority, to um, have some influence in how integrity principles are integrated into these financial products. So we're seeing more government interest, but, but still kind of trying to figure out what that pathway is for um, ensuring this strong market. And then coming back to the Farm Bill, you know, this we're seeing at this very moment, um, actually just about an hour ago, uh, some, some movement uh, from the Senate side. So, but let me back up. So, so at the uh, beginning of May, the House Agriculture Committee um, released a high-level summary of what their Farm Bill proposal was, which was then um, in return, uh, the Senate Ag Committee decided they would, you know, they would release their version of the Farm Bill. And so we're seeing some kind of now back and forth movement of, uh, of, of you know, the, the bill and kind of its draft form. And so in, on May 23rd, the House Ag Committee actually was able to take a vote and report their bill out of committee um, on a bipartisan basis, which was great. Um, but there's not necessarily a clear pathway that now for, for where we go next on the Farm Bill. So we're saying more collaborations needed. We're excited now that uh, Senator Bozeman, so this, this slide is already outdated because uh, they did release their um, summary and framework for a Farm Bill. Um, so we're just hopeful that there's going to be more to come, um, potentially in the lame duck, uh, around um, a Farm Bill that includes provisions for natural climate solutions. and so. You know, we had as part of our task force process, um, you know, three areas of emphasis and of priority with, within conservation, research, and forestry. And so, if you're interested to learn more, um, you can go and see our website on that issue. So, happy to take questions and thank you. Thank you, Leslie. We'll pass this down to you, and I'll go get mine. To remember name tents. We should put something in the back wall, like remember to name tents. All right. Well, it's a good thing. It's a good thing our side by side comparison charts are coming online because we might need them sooner, maybe than an hour ago. It's kind of kind of interesting timing. So good thing. Um, we are going to now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
That way you're not silhouetted against the screen. We just have a blank slide. Um, now we're going to turn to our questions. And I have a couple from the online audience. And we'll keep an eye out. My friend Lindsay will be moving around the room with a microphone in just a moment. But I'd like to start with a question that, um, Shannon, maybe we'll start with you and we'll go through. Um, this has come up a little bit today, but I think it's probably on the minds of folks. And that is, you know, we're talking about, um, in some cases, trees. We're talking about other, you know, natural climate solutions. They have a life cycle. Um, they come and they go. Um, and I'm curious how, um, how do we ensure that natural climate solutions are durable? And, you know, if we're, if we're making these investments to, you know, sequester carbon or reduce greenhouse gas emissions or any of the other benefits, what are some steps that we should be taking and what are some things we should be thinking about to ensure that those benefits are really long lasting? Um, because we have, a, we have a lot of work to do, like you were saying. Yeah, well, that is a really good question. Um, I guess for starters, I like to try to think about, when I hear the word durability, I think of two ways of uh, kind of categorizing that. There's, there's frankly the political or social durability aspect of different climate solutions, as well as the ecological or climate-related durability, like you were asking. Um, so just wanted to kind of flag that. So for example, on the political and social side of things, um, and this is true for anything we might work on in the climate space, you know, these solutions are not uh, undertaken in a vacuum. Uh, so we really have to think about, uh, and someone mentioned this earlier too, but that uh, each of these has to fit, you know, has to fit with actual on the ground needs, um, whether it be ecological, but also social, um, and deliver benefits, you know, and, that, and ideally those are known benefits that are easy for people to kind of see and grasp and understand. Uh, the more they can, uh, then the more likely it is to be socially or politically durable. Um, and then, you know, so acceptance, in other words, public acceptance is, is very important. And then on the ecological side, um, you know, what I might say about that is that, as I kind of alluded to in one of my slides, there's still a lot to learn about the carbon sequestering benefit of a lot of these solutions, um, especially when applied in different geographies and in different settings and conditions and resource availability. Um, so the more that we can gather information in real time um, on their benefits as we are sort of, you know, in a sense there's some risk, there's some experimentation going on, um, then uh, the more we can also be aware as some of these uh, sinks might start declining and we can adapt and be flexible and be prepared to sort of shift to additional strategies. Um, so that might be one thing I'd add. Yeah. Thanks. Jennifer, we're, we're talking with your members. Does this issue come up, and what are some ideas that you have to ensure that these solutions provide, you know, long-lasting benefits? Um, not regulation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, as we had mentioned, voluntary and incentive-based con conservation is incredibly important. Um, I think that you know, when we we look at it, we look at it from a social perspective as well, um, and we have data points going back to the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, and really, it takes a lot of outreach, it takes a lot of acceptance, and um, I think you were talking about this too, Shannon. But this is change management 101, right? Folks have to be bought into it. They have to be part of the solution and they have to know that it works for them. Um, we talked a lot about the economic viability, and that's not just in terms of cost share or you know, these um, various programs, but also making sure that there is market demand for the goods that are actually either um, grown or raised or whatnot um, sustainably and in a climate smart way. And I think that if we have those markets and that consumer demand is there, that is going to be what also helps make some of these things stick. Um, um, yeah, the market piece is just incredibly important. Um, and I think, too, when we think about these programs, um, it's very easy to think about one bureaucracy, right? Um, whether you're looking at farm bill programs or you're looking at these voluntary carbon markets, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of farmer effort that go into participating in these. And I think if we're really looking for some of these incentives to be effective, there also has to be a low administrative burden. Because as we talked about this before, right? Right? Farmers are really busy. Not only do they have multiple jobs, but the job on the farm in and of itself is a 24-hour job, right? Um, that's not something that you shut down every, every day at 5 o'clock. So burden and um, admin is also important. Yeah. Carrie, interested in here, you, you showed your photos, and they're little tiny seedlings, right. but those are going to get the good, good trees. <laughs> 
Right. And I think it's been touched on, but a couple quick points. Um, really, it depends on the science. And we have a lot of science that shows us what species are needed, where, slope, you know, um, climate, other, other aspects there. And same for even the urban tree planting as well, and what species are going to be suitable best in given current conditions and moving forward. So there's really a lot that goes into the science, a lot that goes into the planning as well. So it's not about planting one tree today and another tree tomorrow. It's really we need a lot of trees now next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, we know that these are ongoing strategies and we cannot, it's not just a one-off that we can plant trees now and we're good for the future. We know that this is a continual thing, especially in the West where we're dealing with wildfire. Um, and there was one other piece I was going to hit on that, but um, I'll just, I'll just close with that and just say, um, you know, it's just, it's really about planning and investment. Oh, and the last piece on the urban side is really, again, it's not just about helping folks plant a tree in their yard. It's about helping folks learn and understand how to manage and maintain trees for the future as well. And so there, it's kind of a multi-dynamic to when we come to talking about just planting trees. Um, there's a lot that goes into that and we need to be ready to invest in that for the planning and the long term. Great. Thanks. And Leslie? I'll just echo the points that have already been made and also to emphasize the point on continuous learning. This is not something that, uh, you know, is a very binary, like either we know enough to do it now or we don't. Like it's something that we're going to continue to, you know, learn over time and adapt the programs that we know are working and maybe sunset other programs that aren't working as well and, you know, to, to integrate the best science and data and available evidence. And I really also love the point, obviously, about political durability of these programs. This is something that is going to be, you know, necessary if, to make the long-term investments that are required over the time frames required to address climate change as an issue. We need to have broader consensus and stakeholders who are willing to lean into this as an area of agreement and that we can, you know, create, you know, more opportunity to um, engage with folks who are not necessarily traditional sort of climate stakeholders, but want to have a seat at that table and want to be part of the solution. Seems like we need patience to, you know, learn, to figure things out, but then also to give these solutions time to, to deliver benefits. Um, we have a question in the back row and Lindsay will make her way. And then we have one. We'll go to you next. Hi, I'm Sharon with SEEK. Um, Jennifer, you made an, a note on how important it is to quickly fold in our IRA investments into the Farm Bill baseline. I'm wondering how you all are thinking about the difference between the House and Senate Farm Bill language surrounding the climate guardrails for these investments and specifically what you're hearing on the local level of protecting these climate sideboards um, during these Farm Bill negotiations. That's a great question. Um, I think that we can all recognize that climate change and GHG benefits are incredibly important right now, right? Um, but, you know, when we think about the conservation planning process, um, which we've been using for decades, right, we really think about this in a holistic way. So with NACD, right, we do want to ensure that um, people have the flexibility, and we, I talked a lot about flexibility, right, um, to be able to address the natural resource concerns that are really critical on their own land. And so um, these climate smart ag and forestry practices are certainly part of that. Um, but it is really important that these supporting practices that might have other co-benefits, whether that be water quality, air quality, biodiversity, and so on, are also, um, they also continue to um, be funded through these farm bill programs and such. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. And Leslie, Carrie, Shannon, any of you have anything you'd like to chime in with, please feel free to. Just that, as you note, this is an active area of, of debate and dialogue moving forward. It's going to be you know, part of the key issue area for the conservation title of the Farm Bill, for sure. Great. Thanks. Uh, and we have another question in the audience. Lindsay, right in front of you. Oh, the room. OK. Um, hi there. I hope I can put this in an eloquent way. Um, so. One of the things that Shannon discussed was that nature-based solutions and uh, nature climate solutions have co-benefits. And as someone who's who has never been on the ground, I'm curious, in terms of getting community buy-in and public buy-in for these solutions, which benefits gets folks most excited? Um, because I could imagine that saying, oh, carbon sequestration is a co-benefit might not be the most exciting thing for folks. So I'm curious what benefits excites folks. Sure, I can start with that one. That's a great question. Um, 
Yeah, and you're right. I feel like uh, it's probably not usually going to be leading with carbon sequestration when, <laughs> when talking to real people out in the world. Uh, depends, unless perhaps they're involved in a car, you know, voluntary carbon market or some other uh, objective like that. And I would otherwise say it depends on the community. Depends on who you're talking to, where they are, and what the situation might be. Um, for example, in an environmental justice community, um, which of course are not monolithic in and of themselves, but I just know of some that we've worked with at NWF, where flood, uh, flood mitigation, um, protection from flooding, is probably the number one reason to uh, implement some of these natural climate solutions. Um, protection from storms, similarly, storm surge, uh, if they live along the coastline and are worried about hurricanes. So resilience, in other words, in some communities is, is really top. Uh, other ones, it might be other sorts of economic risks um, from either loss of, you know, farm um, productivity from climate change and drought. Um, and then in the West, yeah, the West obviously is a huge area, but certain, you know, they're not all uh, equal parts in the West. But wildfire and megafires in particular have really come to a heightened level of consciousness for the average person out West. So if there are strategies that can actually improve uh, community safety, basically, and protection from, you know, or re lessened risk, at least, with regards to megafires, um, then that's huge. Uh, and I have a lot of colleagues at West who, for example, can't have their kids go to school or play outside or anything because of the smoke just being so dangerous. Um, so to the extent that air quality can be improved because of natural climate solutions in the West, that's huge. Jennifer, please. Yeah, I might also add this from a producer perspective, right? Um, and so I'm going to fudge the numbers right now, but I think it's something like over 90%, whether it's small, medium, or large farms, are family farms, right? There are very few that are um, operated by corporate entities. And so when we talk to producers, they want to leave their land and their farms better than how they're managing it today, because that's their legacy. That's what they're leaving for their children and their families and their livelihoods. And so I think that that is really the most compelling message when we go out and talk to producers. It is about soil health. It's about water quality. It's about the recreational opportunities, right? All the birds, the animals that come and, you know, nest or whatever they do, right? Um, all of that is really, really important to producers and you get carbon benefits, you get these other environmental co-benefits, but that's really, I think, what the driving message for us is. I feel like Jennifer just covered it so well. No, but I love this question. I really love this question. Again, hailing here from Idaho, an extremely conservative state, um, and when we do polling and when we talk about these types of projects and natural climate solutions, at the end of the day, clean air and clean water are nonpartisan, uh, wildlife recreation, reasons that folks live in the Western US in particular, I think, and are flocking there in large numbers in recent years, um, you know, those are really nonpartisan. And when we can talk about the benefits for these types of areas, um, you know, climate sequestration is, is the co-benefit in that instance. Um, and future generations is oftentimes the way that we hear it talked about in the West and um, in more conservative states, thinking about recognition of climate impacts, but really the worry and the alarm comes when we're talking about future generations. And the last piece I'll mention, especially in an ag-based state like Idaho and many other Midwestern states and states in the West, majority of the economy is based on agriculture or forest products. And so when you're talking about livelihoods and sustaining these industries, um, it doesn't matter how you talk about it. At the end of the day, there is strong interest and support for natural climate solutions and sustainability within these economic streams. And to add on that, just I think a, a component of this kind of local, regional, economic, natural resource-based economies is community identity that's threaded through when we think about, you know, uh, generations upon generations who their parents have been farmers or their, their you know, uh, parents worked in the forest products industry. And, and it, when something happens in that area where that that pillar of kind of the community is lost, that that kind of has social repercussions as well. And so I think another piece of what nature-based solutions and natural climate solutions offers is a pathway to reinvigorate those industries that have historically been associated with um, you know, agriculture and forestry, but now can also be part of this conversation around climate change. Great, thanks. Um, Carrie, I'm going to put you on the spot for just a second. But in the video you showed, there was someone who said, you know, it's hard to say no to a free tree. Um, but I'm curious if you have any sense of how people talk about the program in Boise 
not in sort of like a like an official like co like no one goes and says hey neighbor let's talk about co benefits of tree planting but like on a more like everyday basis when do you have a sense of how people talk about this program and what they think about it like more anecdotally that's a really interesting question um I think, well, it's a really known, it's a really well-known um, initiative within the community. Um, it's kind of, you know, a Link Lakes challenge, the City of Trees challenge. It's kind of um, become pretty common within, like, the vernacular. And um, I think, generally speaking, like, you know, Boise means City of Trees um, is, like, the in some rough translation of the um, French trappers that came. Um, that was kind of, they came across the bluff and were like, Le Bois, Le Bois, the trees, you know? And, and so, like, you talk about identity and cultural identity and really, like, the City of Trees and we're losing our tree canopy and we have more and more people moving and it's going to subdivisions and development further and further out. And so um, it really is, like, core to the identity. It's playing right into that. And again, I think that there is a driving faction of folks that want community-based local involvement and are really yearning for opportunities to make a difference when it comes to climate. I think it can feel like such an existential threat. And when folks can have something tangible and say, like, I planted a tree in my own yard and I'm helping to take, um, you know, initiative here, I think it goes such a long way. And I recognize, again, that it's not the panacea. It's not going to, you know, just get done in Boise, Idaho. But when we talk about pairing this with efforts on our national forest, where we talk about scaling this in cities across Idaho and cities across the country, it really can um, lead to greater impact. And so I think, again, that cultural identity and uh, really that strong initiative um, and interest from local communities to take action, I think that's why it's just spreading and getting such a warm reception. Cool. That's great. That's great. Uh, Lindsay, you have a question up here in the front of the room? Hi, Lori Pickford from Bipartisan Policy Center. My question kind of tees off of Kara's comments, and that's, can you speak about with the terrible wildfires, like what we can do to sustain the seedling supply chain? There seems to be uh, a, a need, and why is there a need, and is it the same in the West as it is in the East as it is in the Northwest? Nobody's jumping in on this one. I will, um, I will attempt, although I will be honest, I can mostly only speak to the West. Um, it is quite amazing, actually, that, you know, we're trying to see where and how we can um, scale up plantings. Um, and we are running into bottleneck after bottleneck with capacity, with nursery capacity, with even um, like seed harvesting, which depending on species has to be done at certain times. And it used to be there was a whole trained workforce that would climb trees and collect cones and all these processing facilities and stuff. Many of them have gone away. I believe there are now six um, um, nurseries in the West, in the whole Western U.S., that supplies um, both Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management restoration efforts. It's not enough. Um, we see large-scale efforts to expand um, the capacity of those nurseries under the Inflation Reduction Act and some of these recent funding programs, but it's going to take a little bit of time. And so I think that, um, you know, we need to keep all these pieces moving and, you um, you know, we also see a lot of other private nurseries or other farmers that are trying to step in and grow native seed or grow, so convert to farming and to, or excuse me, convert to tree growing um, to support some of the need. Um, another really, I think, interesting and neat development we've seen is there's a number of Native American tribes that are setting up and developing their own greenhouses and um, trying to supply some of the need, especially the private sector need, where these nurseries are really in high demand and most of their stock goes toward the public lands. And so I don't think this is totally getting at your question other than to say there are efforts underway to scale. We need a lot more and it's all the way down the chain in terms of capacity, labor forces, housing for labor. I mean, there's so many places to get hung up in this, um, but in order to move at a scale, we have to push in all of the areas. Carrie, I think you nailed that answer, uh, and uh, so not not to add to that, but one one thing to to just tack on is the role of universities in this. And so I meant to mention this when I was 
talking about uh, you know key federal entities, but USDA plays a huge role in pass you know passing funding through to our system of land grant universities in this country, so in tribal colleges and universities, and HBCU historically black colleges and universities that are also land grant universities, and they play an incredibly important role just throughout agricultural research in general and natural climate solutions related research in general, but also on this question of um, seedling supply chain. I know that there are university run. Uh, nurseries that are really important and also training that next generation of like do any of us know how to go out and collect seeds in the forest I don't so you know I would love to have you know these strong robust research um, and university programs to to train people to do that well great if it can be real fast then we do have one last question uh we'll, we'll have happy to have you ask it oh Universities. I'm thinking about grade schools. In the in your video, you showed a little girl by the tree there. If they understood what the value of that tree is in their science class, and then they talk about it with their parents, that's a way of building collaboration and in, in, in support within communities. Um, I work in the energy sector largely. We did that with solar by helping use mathematics as a way of tracking solar production in schools. That's a math exercise, but now all of a sudden they come in and they talk about solar with their parents and they get adopted that way. So it's a way of starting in the ground, ground base, which is kids, not just universities, to build a co coalition. Great, thanks. Um, comments on that, Shannon? Yeah, I'll just add really briefly. Uh, we at National Wildlife Federation have a program called Eco Schools, and uh, it does a lot of what you're saying um, and helps schools all around the country implement different uh, kind of curricula based on you know what's good for wildlife and increasingly what's good for climate. Um, and you're so right; like the, it is it is a great way to uh, engage in a community and vice versa, because uh, kids not only just sort of absorb information, but they actually get involved in their community and they want to go talk at you know city hall and find out what's going on and why aren't we doing this at our school. Um, but on that note, uh, resources are very slim to none when it comes to supporting uh, educational curricula in schools. A lot of these schools are just doing it on their and teachers on their own time um, outside of class. Uh, so just thought of other policy options down the road. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Well, we are at time. Um, I think maybe it makes sense to do just a quick rapid round takeaways. Um, Shannon, maybe we'll start with you and give Leslie the last word, but I'm curious if you have any final takeaways for congressional staff and our audience today, and if you have any specific takeaways that might help people think about how to make these federal programs flexible, to use Jennifer's word of the day, um, that might be an interesting place to focus. Okay. Uh, it's hard to wrap it up with one, one thought, but I think... What I might say is, if I can cheat, these kind of go together, maybe it's two, um, is that it's hard, I mean, this is a huge area of opportunity, which is exciting, but it's also not as uh, easily sort of, I don't know, you can't put a box around it as easily as some other things. I also work on, for example, direct air capture, which is just a much more <laughs> clear. Literally a box. <laughs> literally a box that sucks air. Um, so it's it's a little hard to you you have to be willing to get into a little bit of uh nuance you know talking regions and places and ecosystems and things like that so it does rely on the expertise of a lot of other folks which also makes it more fun um but it might not be as easy to put in a sound bite um so just sort of that in mind and and in relation i don't know that we have a really clearly communicated unified national goal other than to try to kind of live up to that 30 percent you know potential in reducing greenhouse gas emissions but i think um you know we're ready for one i think we're ready to really bring it to kind of the next level of national awareness. Thanks. Jennifer? So my comments will probably be in the context of Farm Bill and appropriations, um, but I, I think that it's important to recognize that conservation is incredibly important. It is what enables all of these nature-based solutions that have a huge impact, not only in the environment, but on, it's valuable to producers as well, whether you're thinking about their returns or also their land values. Um, and with that, the TA is incredibly important as well, I do, technical assistance. Um, I don't think that that's something that we can really undervalue because it takes so much outreach and so much um, education when we work with producers, particularly small and new producers, right? Um, I think that, um, you know, when we talk about flexibility as well, it's important for not only statutes, but um, policies to not be overly prescriptive. There is no way you will ever be able to predict every single scenario 
scenario that this program is going to be used. And it's really, really important that um, uh, you know government and partners on the ground have the um, flexibility to interpret that in a way that makes sense for them, their communities, as well as their environments. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that this is a capacity question too. We talked about capacity in um, you know many different ways, but technical capacity for technical assistance is also really critical. So, right, thanks, yeah. Carrie. I feel like so many of the specifics are being hit on. So I will hit maybe just a broader note, and that is. Um, don't count out conservative states when it comes to natural climate solutions. Um, again, coming from a state like Idaho, and we have the polling, and we have the numbers, and we have all the information that shows there's really little downside and little risk to supporting broad efforts when it comes to natural climate solutions. Um, it's just an area where, there again, there's broad support, and folks are really ready to lean in. And I would also add that you know these funding, um, new funding, these policies, these programs are we're really showing how to work through these channels in different ways, through partners, through collaboratives, through NGOs, through other partners. It doesn't all have to be capacity within the federal government and that we are really expanding different types of agreements, different ways of getting this work done. And so investments will not be lost in that way. Um, so we just really encourage support. Thanks. Leslie, last words? Yeah, thanks. And you know, just to build on that, I think, I think that there's, I want to leave you all with a sense of optimism. So although there's urgency, to address climate change, to get moving and implementing solutions. We have now you know, this, this area of natural climate solutions where we can bring together constituencies that maybe historically haven't seen eye to eye on, a, on particular policy provisions. And so I think that there's a lot of momentum and a lot of kind of movement and coalition building that we can see at lots of different levels, um, both state and nationally and even internationally. And we're seeing you know, great opportunity for kind of pulling together that both economics, climate, culture, and, and all of that kind of combining here for, for something where we can get really excited about the possibilities. And so I really want to encourage everyone here to engage with everybody on this panel that, uh, you know, the folks that put this um, event together because we are a resource to you to help move these ideas into policy and that there are actual concrete pathways that we all know and that we can see opportunity to, to get this done. So thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, that was a great panel, Shannon, Jennifer, Carrie, and um, Leslie. So I think they deserve an extra big round of applause for the great job. <laughs> the light's been turned back on, so it's time to go. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to say special thanks again to Representatives Matsui and Tonko and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition for their help today in the room and also for the question. Um, I'd like to thank my great team members, Dan O'Brien, Omri, who's actually on vacation this week, but we, we miss him, but we managed to pull it off without him. Uh, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole. Um, if you wanna hang out and talk with us for a little bit, we're all wearing our lapel pins today. So we'd love to learn a little bit more about what you're working on. This is also the first briefing of our summer intern cohort. So big thanks to Ainsley, Lindsay, and Jillian for helping us uh, today as well. And big thanks to Scott, our videographer, for helping us look good online. Our next event is July 30th. That's a Tuesday. It's the Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. You really won't want to miss that. We have seven incredible panels, tons of panelists. We'll have an exhibition space where people can bring their wares, sort of, uh, and tell, talk to you. It's a great networking opportunity, so definitely encourage you to sign up for that. And the best way to keep up with everything on uh, at ESI is by subscribing to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. If you haven't yet taken the survey, this is the link to do it. If you have a moment, we'd really appreciate hearing how you thought things went today. And like I said, we'd reread every response. So with that, enjoy the rest of the amazing weather out there today. We should, probably should have had this briefing outdoors. It would have been, there's nice trees on the Capitol grounds. We probably would have been on brand. So thanks to everyone. And uh, we'll be back here at the end of July for the expo. And thanks again. It was great. Super good. Thank you.